Is Bollywood cozying up to Narendra Modi's far-right Hindu nationalist government? I'll ask two of the Indian film industry's best-known creative figures. I'm Mehdi Hassan. With the Indian government's targeting of minorities, demonstrations against Narendra Modi's increasingly authoritarian rule have sprung up across India. So why has Bollywood been so silent? Is India's powerful film industry afraid of Modi and the BJP? I'll ask screenwriter Javed Akhtar and director Mahesh Bhatt. But first, Ethiopian Prime Minister Abe Ahmed won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2019 for ending a decades-long conflict with Eritrea and introducing long-overdue reforms to his country. But after cracking down on protesters and dissolving his own ruling coalition, is Ethiopia under Abe sliding back into repression and violent conflict? This week's headliner, close ally and advisor to the Ethiopian Prime Minister, Lencho Bati. Lencho Bati, thank you for joining me on Upfront. Your Prime Minister, Abe Ahmed, won the 2019 Nobel Peace Prize at the end of a year in which he locked up journalists, detained protesters and cut off the internet. Is that really how Nobel Peace Prize winners are supposed to behave? I don't know where you get these facts. He, there is no any journalist in prison now. He didn't arrest five journalists in September 2019. Amnesty International said the police failed to produce any shred of evidence for their alleged crimes. No, that's an exaggerated thing. What now, does that mean, exaggerated? There is no single... Exaggerated journalist. means what, there was one I mean, journalist, there, not there, five? There, there, there is one incident in where fake news uh, has been uh, uh, put in a market mm. to incite violence uh, against uh, ethnic groups. So why is Amnesty's director for East and Southern Africa saying the return of mass arrests of opposition activists and supporters is a worrying signal in Ethiopia? These sweeping arrests risk undermining the rights to freedom of expression and association ahead of this year's election. No, this is not happening in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a free... So, Everybody is so free get, now to... So you're to saying Amnesty's their... making this stuff up? Well, I'm, te I'm telling you, all the journalists are out of prison. All political prisoners are... To be out of prison, but you're admitting they were in no, prison at one stage. These, these are prisoners detained okay. by previous regime. All oppositions, armed and peaceful, are invited back. So the political space is wide and everybody is in the country registering, uh, campaigning in different parts of the country. I'm not questioning that people aren't campaigning or registering. I'm just saying that Human Rights Watch, for example, has said dozens of ethnic Amhara journalists were held uh, in 2019 in their report on the country. I mean, you were on this show in 2016 as someone living in exile, criticising the previous government for being repressive, authoritarian, locking up protesters and journalists. And now you're being criticised. Your government is being criticised for doing the same thing. Do you no. see the irony? Yeah, this government is not doing... I'm not aware of this arrests, and this government is not arresting journalists. How about internet blackouts? There is no any time internet was blocked. I mean, who should people believe? Well-known, well, well well-respected well human rights yeah, groups? Yeah, we, we need to do further investigation. But I, I think you I do. Mean, I first think of all, the internet, to check out the the internet in the on. country is very, very, very... The service is very low. The okay. coverage is very low. And, uh, but I have not come across any any incident where internet so you haven't come across blocked. detained protesters, you haven't come across detained journalists, you haven't come across internet blackouts? No. That's very convenient, given it's well documented I, I by have, human rights observers. I have not. I'm a human rights advocate. I've not. Okay. I've not seen any. Your prime minister won a peace prize for ending this decades-long conflict with neighbouring Eritrea, and he's been applauded for that by many around the world and at home. But even in Ethiopia, the conflicts continue, ethnic conflicts, the violence has in fact escalated in many places. Ethiopia has one of the largest internally displaced populations in the world. 1.6 million people internally displaced, fleeing violence. That's a pretty massive failure on your government's part, is it not? Well, the displacement has uh, the, uh, its own cause. Uh, as you know, Ethiopia is going through reform. That means the regime or the group that is overthrown we're uh, uh, sponsoring conflicts in different parts of the country. So this is a politically motivated uh, uh, displacement in order to uh, 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 sabotage the transition and the reform that the prime minister Hold put on, you're in saying place. three quarters so, of a million people were displaced no, yeah, there, there in the first half of 2019. Yeah, there That's there, all just a political move to embarrass of, the government. Of, of Nearly course, a million people. Yeah, these people, Ethiopian people, used to live together peacefully. This is a politically masterminded 
uh, agitated from behind in order to sabotage the reform. Isn't the danger... Once that, that structural problem is removed, now people are back to their residence. And today now, the, 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 the Ethiopian ethnic groups in every part of the country are living together in a very harmonious way. I, I interview a lot of people on this show from different countries, different political parties. You've been on this show twice, and it's interesting interviewing you because you came on this show in, in a debate with the then member of the Ethiopian government. You were in exile at the time, living in the US. Yes. And if you had said all this stuff then, and he, your opponent then in the government, had said, well, this is all just you trying to make us look bad. Yeah. Do you understand? Your arguments can be used either way. I do understand. You, so, you could sound like the previous government. I do understand. The record of the prime minister is clear. The, 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 our, well, our the numbers are clear. Our prime minister... Displaced people is going Our up. prime minister rehabilitated peace with Eritrea. He mediated peace in, between South and Sudan. He has an but he excellent can't stop people from being displaced yeah. in his own he country. He has an excellent relationship but with Somalia and Kenya. But he can't stop people from being displaced in his own country. Yeah, but, Hundreds of thousands of them. But the hands, the hands, who is masterminding all this violence is aimed who? at... Who is this? You sound like a conspiracy the overthrown, the overthrown elites. OK. OK, the people who were enjoying privilege for the last 27 years, they might... They want to make so, sure this process is sabotaged. I mean, do you have any evidence? So the for prime that? minister is very patient. I mean, do you have any evidence for, for that? For example, what's your evidence for that? There is. There is what's a clear, the evidence? There is a clear evidence. What is it? There is a clear evidence. I mean, you can't just say, this, you can't say being, there is a clear evidence is, three times. What is the evidence? Weapon is being smuggled to okay. these groups. You found these weapons. Yes. You produced these for the world. Of, of course, there is a lot of weapons that was, Where from? that was captured. They come through through the borders, and money has been distributed. In order to this is all very vague, uh, about And an attempt on the life of the prime minister also uh, was tried in Addis. So these people are leaving no stone un 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 unturned in order so, to, 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 to prevent Ethiopia to transit into democracy. Your party came to power in 2018, and now your prime minister, Abe Ahmed, is transforming Ethiopia's ethnic federal political system. Some would say without any real electoral mandate, he's dissolved the ruling coalition, he's set up this whole new party, the Prosperity Party, to which your own defence minister has come out and criticised and said there are many dangers to doing these big dramatic changes in a hurry right now. So why do it? Why all this upheaval? It was a natural process to, 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 to come up with a party that is unified under one major shared goal. So uh, it's a party decision, it's a member's decision, the central committee decision, let me finish, executive committee decision. So it, it has been done through the party rules and regulation. So why did your defence minister say merging this party is not timely and there are many dangers? We are in a transition. This is borrowed time. It is not our time. We should focus on maintaining peace and stability. Why are you not focusing on peace and stability? Why are you doing these dangerous things, according peace, to your own defence minister? Peace and stability is... A burning issue. There is no question about that. Okay, the the prime minister liberalised the political space. All oppositions are invited in, including those who are in armed struggle, those who are in prison was released, and now the political space is free. So there's no danger to any of them. Very, this is not a dangerous move. Well, the changes in Ethiopia are very sweeping. Okay, we have to either, okay, transit Ethiopia into democracy. Otherwise, there is no any other alternative. I understand, but we have a global okay. audience watching this yeah. show. There, watching this there, show. There is no any other alternative. I understand. Yeah. Our viewers around the world are watching the show. They see you, senior advisor to the Office of Prime Minister, saying this is a good thing, and then they hear the Defence Minister of your government saying this is not a good thing. Who should they believe? Well, everybody is entitled to his opinion. Not really. He's yeah. in your government. You yeah. should really be singing from the same hymn sheet. Yeah, but what he said is, what he said is. He's not opposing the goal, he's not opposing the process, but he's saying maybe things are going so fast. OK, that is his opinion. The current prime minister, your boss, Abe Ahmed, has been in power for less than two years. He was not elected directly to office. And in November, with just months uh, before this upcoming general election in August, uh, he approved all these big changes, this dissolution of the r ruling coalition. Does he have a mandate to do any of this stuff? I it mean, nobody, a... nobody elected him to do any of this stuff. The party, it is a party. This is but it affects done. the Ethiopian constitution, the federal structure. No, he has not done no. it. Ethiopian federation is state. He is not tampering with the federation. He's a federalist. The multinational federation is a constitutional order. What is being transformed, what is being rebranded is a party. Not and he has a mandate for that, you he think? Has a, yeah, the members have a mandate, and the members are doing okay. that through massive deliberation. 
deliberation has been taking place within the party for, for a year. Len Chobati, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Thank you so much. Thank you. Attacks on students, mob lynchings, an escalation in hate crimes, and the mainstreaming of a hardline brand of Hindu nationalism. These have all been features of India under the leadership of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, whose party lost a key election in Delhi this week. Yet few celebrities have spoken out against Modi or the rise in intolerance. Many of them instead are big supporters of the Prime Minister. But today we're joined by two of the biggest names in Bollywood who haven't been shy to make their voices heard. Javed Akhtar is an acclaimed screenwriter, songwriter and poet, as well as a former member of India's Upper House of Parliament. And Mahesh Bhatt is one of India's best-known film directors and producers, who's directed over 50 films since his career began in 1974. Javed Akhtar, Mahesh Bhatt, thank you both for joining me on Upfront. Javed Akhtar, let me start Pleasure. with you. How bad, actually, is the situation in India today, in your view, in terms of rising nationalism, bigotry, authoritarianism? Well, uh, if I look around in this world, there are places which are much worse. But the fact is that situation in India, without looking outside, I can say was never uh, so dark as it is today. And, and Mahesh, but would you agree with that? How much is the India that once touted its secular, pluralistic, multi-faith credentials, the India that you and Javed uh, grew up in, how much of that India is gone, do you think? Well, it was called the mother of civilization. It was the land which gave birth to people like Nanak and the Mahatma, Mr. Mahatma Gandhi. And the fact is that what Javed Saab just said is that it couldn't have been worse. And the night is only deepening. We have had a ray of hope just a few days ago when the the BJP got a drubbing uh, when they lost the election to Arvind Kejriwal's Ahmadi Party. But that's just one little ray of hope. Uh, Mahesh, but you said in the past that fascism is quote alive and well in the land of the Mahatma. What would you say to critics who say, that's hyperbole, that's an exaggeration. India is a democratic country. Narendra Modi won his majority last year fair and square. Well, I would say that uh, they conveniently look away from the, that, that explosive silence. The, the Muslims of, this, of my country, and not only the Muslims, even the other minorities, have never felt more insecure as they feel now. If they choose to turn a, uh, their face away from this naked truth. It's their privilege. But they do India a lot of harm. When people are frightened to speak, when people worry about what's going to happen next, there's palpable anxiety in the air. And if they do not want to see it, it's their tragedy. They will have to take stock of the situation and act with urgency. Uh, Javed Akhtar, Mahesh Bhatt mentioned Muslims and other minorities and the fear that they have. Just in the past year alone, since Modi's re-election, uh, we've had the citizenship law, which for the first time introduces a religion test for immigrants, for refugees from neighboring countries. Everyone except Muslims uh, are eligible. You have a registry of citizens in Assam, which has excluded nearly two million people, many of them Muslims, uh, from the citizenship list. You have the Supreme Court decision which allows for the building of a Hindu temple on a disputed religious site, the site of a, a mosque that was destroyed by Hindu nationalists. All of that in just in the past year. Uh, is it fair to say that Muslims in India now feel like they're in the firing line? As a matter of fact, as long as we will consider it a Muslim problem, a problem of minority, we will not be able to understand it. This is the problem of India, and this is the problem of Indians. You think Muslims can be a stepping stone to reach the platform where some people want to reach. But they are not there and they can be the means. The fact is that uh, this threat or this silence that uh, Mahesh was talking about is not only on Muslims. I mean, uh, it's in the majority community also. Pe people are intimidated. The fact is that you, when you look around, we see that a uh, uh, scope or uh, uh, space for dissension is shrinking by the day. Today, uh, there is hardly any uh, uh, channel, TV channel in India that openly criticizes the present regime. It was not so six years back. Indeed. So, 
Let me bring in Mahesh Bhatt here. The reality is, as you well know, that the BJP uh, and the RSS, the ideological force behind the BJP, the paramilitary group that forms a lot of the ideological backbone of the BJP, has been very anti-Muslim for many decades now. And when you look at what's happening in, for example, uh, Kashmir, which was India's only Muslim-majority state before the, the government went along and basically broke it up a few months ago and has put it under siege, you can understand why Muslims in India and Muslims around the world are looking at India and saying, what is going on here in terms of Islamophobia, anti-Muslim bigotry, anti-Muslim hate, especially when you look at, for example, the situation in Kashmir? Well, I think uh, Islamophobia, uh, the reasons of Islamophobia blew through the world after 9-11, and I think... The phobia here is manufactured because I don't think that the average Indian uh, is so frightened of uh, a Muslim. I mean, that kind of a fear has been crafted, been structured uh, day in and day out. Media person go out there, the, the pliable channels uh, are working around the clock to create to create the other. They need the other to 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 stay in power and to hate the Muslim. Is, has become, is the lifeline of the BJP. Let's not mince our words. There is institutional bias which has been there since the dawn of time, I mean, since the birth of the nation. But now it is naked. The mask is off. And they are doing it right under their nose. And Javed Dr. Uh, Mahesh Bhatt says the mask is off. Uh, Narendra Modi won a second term. Um, he's escalated his... Uh, I don't know what you want to call it, campaign of dominance, of authoritarianism, of uh, consolidation of power for his party and for his movement. What's interesting about Modi is many people here in the United States, where I am, for example, like to compare Modi and Trump. Trump doesn't actually believe anything, whereas Modi is a lifelong ideologue. He's been in the RSS since he was a child. How dangerous a leader do you think Narendra Modi is? Let's not simplify these things. It is like believing that Hitler only hated Jews, otherwise everything was hunky-dory. He was very happy with the rest of the Germany. And he, whatever he did, he did only against uh, 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 Jews. Otherwise, he was so good to everybody else. It's not true. The fact remains that what is fascism? You create an enemy, you put your own people in an imaginary siege, and that is how you control them. At the moment, if through all this uh, effort, uh, people are losing their civil rights, people are losing their freedom of expression, or confidence at least, to express themselves, it is not happening to one community. It is not happening to one people. Do you believe Narendra Modi is a fascist? Of course, he is. I mean, fascists don't have horns on their heads. Fascist is thinking. <laughs> And this thinking that we are better than others and whatever problems we have, it is because of these people. The moment you hate people in wholesale, you are a fascist. Uh, Mahesh, but let me ask you this. When it comes to Modi and Bollywood, because I do want to talk about your industry, you have Bollywood stars congratulating the Prime Minister on his re-election on Twitter. You have that famous selfie that got so much coverage of a bunch of Bollywood actors, including your daughter Alia, the acclaimed actress, I believe, that they took with Modi. You have the industry's top stars, the Khans and others, completely silent on the citizenship bill, on Kashmir, on the attacks on students. Are you disappointed in some of your fellow artists that they haven't taken the kind of stand that you have? Well, I can't put myself up as a model and ask them to emulate me, who gives me that right. But fear is a political tool which has been used since the dawn of time. And look, we are in the business of entertainment, and mass entertainment content is consumed there in the cinema halls, which become very vulnerable during release time. And these guys have the foot soldiers there to play havoc with people whom they don't like. So. Uh, individually, an actor or an actress may want to take a stand and be very vocal, but then there's a collective interest of the tribe which is voiced around him or her that, look, it affects the entire unit, it entire the project, there are crows riding on it. So I think that is, they feel very vulnerable, but the explosive silence speaks for itself that these people are, are frightened to... Uh, to speak their minds, even if they feel completely different to what they are posturing at it privately. Uh, Javed Akhtar, it's pretty indisputable, isn't it, that Bollywood, with a few notable exceptions, is now basically Team Modi. 
No, I won't say that, but the fact remains that so many voices are missing. But the fact is that it is the proof that the society is scared. Do all these people agree with him or agree with the philosophy that he, he is uh, uh, recommending or his ideology or they agree with whatever the party is doing? Do they think lynching is wonderful? It should happen more often. Do they really think that? No. And if they don't think that, then why are they not saying it? There's a question. Why they are not saying What's it? What's your what answer? Is it fear? So scared? Is it purely fear? It's fear. Purely fear. Fear of losing their because careers or fear of or worse than that? Fear of physical harm? Because all those people, all those people whom I've seen in the group photo with the Prime Minister, I know them personally and I know what they say. Are you disappointed then that they seem to be hypocrites? Uh, yeah, well, no. I, uh, you see, you can't ask people to become martyrs. Yeah. Well, it let, is their choice. OK, so let me put this to you, Javed Akhtar. The government hosted a dinner for Bollywood stars recently to explain why the Citizenship Amendment Act, this controversial act, is a good thing. To, presumably so they could have these Bollywood stars act as influencers, messengers. You were invited and you didn't go, but a lot of people did go. How do you push back against that when the government is able... The fact is a lot of people didn't go. Those who are publicly and actively supporting the present regime, only they were there. So you have hope, so you have hope that there's still enough people on your side to kind of resist government propaganda, as it were? No, I don't think about that. You see, besides that, film industry is a minuscule part of this society. And, really? Uh, it's Bollywood is a minuscule part of India? It's one of the biggest... Uh, oh, the... oh, I'll tell you how. OK. First of all, its influence is highly exaggerated. Theatre or cinema's influence is highly exaggerated. No country can claim that a revolution or a great social change came into that society because of a film. If it has happened, please let me know. Uh, let me ask Mahesh Bhatt. You're one of India's uh, best-known directors. You directed something like 50 films. You're a household name. Do you agree with Javed Akhtar there that, it, that it, the role of Bollywood is exaggerated? I mean, right now in India, you have a bunch of very hyper-nationalistic movies being made, uh, very movies about the Indian military, about the Indian nation. A lot of people say that Bollywood is producing movies which only uh, boost the BJP's message. What Javed Sam is saying is that if movies and books could change nations, uh, this nation would have become a paradise by now. Uh, prior to Mr. Modi's arrival on the scene, there were innumerable films made which spoke about uh, coexistence and the plurality that we are under fire today. But yes, they, they do contribute to create an illusion that uh, the major, the major the, the, the stream is flowing in on their side, and uh, that's what their limited purpose is. But on the ground, I think there are other more serious things which ultimately decide the, uh, which particular party will rule us. And uh, filmmakers, uh, actors, actresses, filmmakers have a very limited role to play in creating the atmospherics. Yeah. I'll agree that recently films after films have come that have given a saffron version of history. Uh, some of them did well uh, in the box office, some of them failed. So again, the criteria was not whether they are giving a, a saffron uh, version or they were not. But uh, the fact is, I must accept at this point that uh, recently there have been quite a few films that had the saffron version, the right-wing version of history. So let me ask both of you this question. Um, given that you're saying that the, the film industry is producing films that seem to boost uh, the right-wing version uh, of what India should look like, given you're both saying that some of your colleagues in the industry are free, afraid to speak out, given you both are saying that this government right now in India, the world's largest democracy, is fascist, uh, what hope do you have for the future? Is there hope uh, for India, Mahesh Bhatt? Well, man lives in hope and dies in hope, and we saw that little way of hope uh, a few days ago in Delhi. I don't think that as long as the... It, in the DNA of India, there is plurality, and I don't think that you can reduce a nation as diverse as this to one narrative. If you try to impose just one narrative on this nation, uh, it will revolt, and I don't think any political party can do that in the long run. Javed Akhtar? I have unshakable belief in Indian common sense. 
I believe that Indian, even an Indian who is not educated, who is uh, not sophisticated in uh, modern terms, is not a fool. He's a sensible person. Even sensible people sometimes stray up to a point, but then they know that now they are going off the cliff, they come back. And uh, this is also a passing phase, as a matter of fact, it is important because we are living in these times. Otherwise, if you turn the pages of a book of history and by mistake you turn two pages, you escape 200 years. So these 10 years, 15 years are not the end of the world. This too shall pass. Javed Akhtar, Mahesh but on that note, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you both so much for joining me on Upfront. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week. <laughs>